Well, let's read our foundation scriptures. Once again, we haven't done that in a little while. Um, next Wednesday night, listen, we'll, we'll leave here as soon as church is over and run over to Harvest Church. Uh, the Hagans will be over there. We want to be a part of that, so we'll get done. Um, I think those services are starting at 7 at night, but their, their worship's going to run about 45 minutes or so. Uh, so, um, you know, by the time we get done and get over there, the, 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 and of course, and whatever else they're doing, I, I'm not sure what night or day they're going to talk about war partners and that kind of thing. So, uh, praise God. Habakkuk 2 4 says, Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. Romans 1 17 says, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Galatians 3 11 says, That no man is justified by the sight of, in the sight of God. It is evident, for the just shall live by faith faith. And now that the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. So we have four, four different passages. They use the phraseology in, in one way or another about the just shall live by faith. Um, or, you know, one says by his faith, and just shall live by faith. Um, so, but basically the same phraseology, the just shall live by faith. So we're teaching on faith. We've covered a lot of ground so far. Uh, we've been talking, we've got last week and the week before we were talking about the, uh, the threefold nature of man and how the man is a spirit. He possesses a soul. He lives in a body. And um, talking about how that we believe with the heart is the same thing as believing with our spirits, that the spirit of man is the heart of man. And so we, we kind of covered that ground. So we, we just we need to make sure we understand that when we're talking about believing God, we're talking about faith, we're talking about something of the heart, and we're not talking about a, 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 our spirit. We're not talking about um, kind of a, a philosophically or uh, intelligentsia of, of agreement that something is so, but out of your heart you have faith. See, faith is not of the head, it's of the heart. Uh, one preacher said this one time, he said, you can have faith in your heart and doubt in your head and it'll still work. Remember the guy that came to Jesus one time and um, he said, all things are possible for him that believe. He said, uh, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. And Mark Brzee used to say this. He said, he said, the guy said this. He said, Lord, I, he said, I, I believe you in my heart. My head's giving me a fit. And uh, that's, that's the way it is sometimes. How many of you ever had your head give you a fit? But in your heart, you it's all right. Now, your head's fighting for you, to, for you to lean over and hook up with it. You ever had that where your head's fighting your heart? Well, see, faith is of the heart. So we're, we're going to move on from there. Now, let's, we're going to start talking about uh, some fa faith for different things. Um, um, at least at this point, we're going to talk about uh, faith for prosperity. Um, we, you know, we talk about faith for healing so much. We're just going to talk about faith, faith for prosperity. Go over to 3 John 2, the third uh, epistle of John. That's right before the book, uh, right over there near the book of Revelation. Um, real close to it. And it's right, it's right before Jude. There's only one Jude in between there and, and uh, Revelation. John says this. He says, Beloved, I wish... Now, the word wish uh, could also have been translated, and my margin says this, a lot of Bibles will have that in their margin, and says, I'll pray. All right, so, I'm going to read it that way. I pray above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospers, or in relation to your, the prosperity of your soul. In other words, um, as, as your suke is renewed in the Word of God, as your suke is made whole in the Word of God, restored in the Word of God, uh, he prays that you'll prosper financially and be in health. Um, now, I, I believe there's, there's, there's reasons for this. We can have faith for prosperity, but I'll tell you something. In, in that suke, in, um, in the soulless realm, is where a lot of your character is developed and carried out. I mean, you know, it doesn't do you any good to have money if you don't know what to do with it rightly. Now, I, I like what Creflo Dollar says. He says, money is a magnifier. Money is a magnifier. Listen, you, you see these people, they're dirt poor, they get rich, and next thing you know, they got, they got escort services. They don't have, they don't have a, a, a prostitutes, they got escort services. Are you here? They're not doing, you know, nickel bags, weed, they're doing designer drugs. They're not drinking, you know, Mad Dog 2020. They're drinking Chardonnay. But they're still doing all the same things they were doing. They just do it at a higher end. 
and they're doing it more exposed. Okay? A lot of the secret things are exposed because they can live it in a different realm. And so money is a magnifier. If you've got character flaws, money will magnify it. Hello? If you don't, if you know, listen, we, we, he got money, all of a sudden started committing adultery on his wife. He had adultery in his heart before he ever got the money. Yeah. He just had the money to afford to go do the things. Are you here? And of course, you know, uh, there, are, there are a certain element of women that if you've got money, they don't care what you look like. Hello? I mean, they just see you as daddy greenbacks. You know, they just, high, they, they don't go there, they just high class hoes. Did I say that in church? <laughs> high class prostitutes. Well, the Bible talks about whoredom, so that's just a biblical word, you know. They, 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 they're, still, they're still pimping, their, uh, they're still prostituting themselves out there for the money. So, uh, but money's a magnifier. So, John says, I pray that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. Renewing your mind to the Word of God. <clears throat> having, having those things under control. Uh, Kenyon says, E.W. Kenyon says in his writings, he says this, that a sinner, I mean a Christian, a Christian, a Christian who does not renew his mind to the Word of God will, renew it, will imitate a sinner. A Christian who does not renew his mind to the Word of God will imitate a sinner. What, what does uh, Romans say? Let's, let's run over to Romans real quick. Romans 12. It's bears. What's that got to do with faith? Well, you know, Paul, John says he, he prays above all things that we prosper and be in health even as our soul prospers. Now, John 12, verse 1 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye uh, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable, or, or better translated, spiritual service. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and perfect and acceptable will of God. Now, notice it says here, be not conformed. We've talked about this before. The word conform comes from a Greek word that means to be fashioned, molded, or shaped according to the world. But be transformed comes from the Greek metamorpho. We get our English word metamorphosis from that. And so he says here, don't be fashioned, shaped according to the world, but have a metamorphosis by the renewing of your mind. Okay? And that you may prove what is that good, perfect, and acceptable will of God. So this tells me that if you don't have the transformation, you're going to be conformed. Or you're going to act like a sinner. If you don't renew your mind, you're going to act like the world. So, John says here, now when it comes to prosperity, I, I say this, I want to make sure that we understand that, that we can go out and start working on our faith for prosperity. You need to work on your character too. What would you do with the money? I know people right now, if they got rich tomorrow, you'd never see them in church again. All they want to do is just run up and down the road. They want to travel and, do the, and see the world and have nothing to do except, you know, uh, talk to the Lord a couple, couple times a month and uh, travel. They just want, they, want, they want to be on the open road. They don't have any constraints in life. I mean, buddy, if God made them a millionaire tomorrow, I mean, multimillionaire, debt paid, everything paid off, you'd never see them again. They might visit every 20 years. If their, if their travels brought them back through here. Well, that's not character. God doesn't want to make people rich so they have nothing to do but ride around and do nothing. Hello? Now, I would, I'd, I'd tell you, I'd like to be rich and just travel around teaching Bible schools. That would be cool. You know? Raymond has 115 Bible schools. I could go to each one, uh, go, go a half week at one, a half week at another, and cover them all in the, almost, well, I can't cover them all in a year anymore, almost all in a year. That would be cool. I'd, be, I'd be love to travel and do ministry if, that was, if that's what the Lord wanted me to do. Amen. But, you know, I, I don't want to just sit around and, 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 and go on the cruise on the River Seine and go on the Black Sea and go to the Alaska and go to the Caribbean and go to Hawaii and just do nothing. God has more for us than just riding around doing nothing. So God wants to work on your character. And if there's, if there's issues in your life where you haven't dealt with certain areas in your life and uh, you get money, you're just going to misuse it. Remember the guy, uh, it was local. So Virginia, West Virginia won the, won the lottery. I think he went bankrupt or died. he died or his grandkids, ki granddaughter was involved in some kind of murder thing. Or the, the, and he was, he was caught, he, he was going to strip clubs with half a million dollars. And when he first did it, he was going to give, he was going to give, he was going to tie to the church. And he was going to, he loved the Lord and he wasn't going to change. And he's going to, he's going to play in poker and stuff, half a million dollars in a, in a briefcase. And either the granddaughter or her boyfriend was, ended up in a murder thing. In his home. See? Um, another example, you know, take, take a lot of these people, these professional athletes. 
They come out of poverty. They come out of abject poverty. And they get, to the, they get up there and they just spend money like crazy. All they've done. And, and really, a lot of them uh, used to be. Now, I think some of this has been corrected because some people have gotten smart. But um, about 20 years ago, the average NBA player retired bankrupt. Although they were making millions of dollars a year. Their agent floated them until their career was over, and then they dumped them because they didn't have any money. And they, they, had, they had skimmed that money out, and they had lived the lifestyle. They just ate the money. And retired bankrupt. Retired bankrupt. How can you imagine making millions of dollars a year for 10, 15 years, and then retiring bankrupt? Character. So let's say this. If we're going to prosper with God and have faith for prosperity. Alongside that goes renewing our mind to the Word and having the character of God developed in us so we can handle the prosperity and it not handle us. The love of money is the root of all evil. Money is not, but the love of it is. Okay. So, 1 Timothy 6, 12, 10. That's where we just, we just quoted that, but 1 Timothy 6, 10 is where that came from. It says, um, it says there, let's back up here. Let, let as many servants as are under the yoke count, verse 1, count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. And they that have, have not believing masters, let them not despise them, because they are brethren, but rather, um, I'm sorry, but they that have believing masters, let them not despise them, because they are brethren, but rather do them service, because they are faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit those, these things teach and exhort. If any man teach otherwise, and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to the godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but dotting about questions and strives of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men, and corrupt minds, and destitute of truth, suppose, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain we can carry nothing out. Now stop here for a second. He says here that they suppose that gain is godliness. How many people have you seen that, that, that have tried to say that, you know, I've got great faith because I've got great prosperity. I've got a lot of money. That proves I've got great faith. They're riding around in all, their pimp mobile. They're riding around like the world, acting like the world, spending like the world. they got a lot of money. And, so, and they go into churches and tell everybody that's it's because God blessed them. You know, Paul comes back behind that and says godliness with, cont uh, supporting, uh, he said godliness with contentment is great gain. We've got, you've got to learn to be content where you are before you can handle another stage of prosperity. If you can't be content where you are, let me, let me just, I'm, I'm going to break it to you real sweet. Real sweet, real nice. If you ain't happy where you are, you ain't going to be happy with a million dollars. Because you'll just, you'll just change everything, and the things that are going on in your life will just be amplified on a larger scale, and you will just be just as dissatisfied with life as you were when you didn't have anything. Because you'll end up not having anything. Let's face it. If you don't got any money, you're riding around, you, you, and you manage, you got a car. What, do you, what kind of car do you have? One you can afford? And see, people get real, real, real rich. They go out and buy quarter million and million dollar cars. Now, I'll be honest with you. When people put a million, they don't want to put the million dollar car on the road because it's going to get hit by a rock or something like that. They spent a million dollars. Well, well, you spent a thousand dollars on it. Well, yeah, but they're making, they're making this kind of money. They're just spending at the level they're living. They're not content. We gotta, we've got to learn that just because you know, if, God, if God made you a multimillionaire tomorrow, doesn't mean you've got to go out and buy a 10 million dollar house. You can live really nice in a million dollar house or whatever. I'm, you know what I'm saying? You got to learn to be content at certain places. Um, Larry um, Burkett, I believe it was Larry Burkett, had a teacher on, on, on finances a number of years ago. And one of the things he said was very interesting. He said, set a maximum lifestyle. In other words, no matter how much money you make, set a maximum lifestyle. Why? Because that way, if you set a max, in other words, um, you know, I'm worth $50 million, but I'm going to live in a $750,000 house, and that's just it. I don't need a $20 million house. You understand what I'm saying? I don't need a $2 million car sitting in the, in the garage, you know. Um, yeah, I could have them, but I need to be content 
at a maximum lifestyle because we could use this money for the gospel. You got to be, you know, you got to be careful about that. You don't, you don't want to get extremes on either side. But you got to get it where you know, just not just about well, these preachers who are going out and they write a book and they're worth twenty, they're getting twenty million dollars a year to run around and be lascivious. And what are they doing? They're just sucking money out of the body of Christ so they can run around and keep selling books. And then divorcing their spouses. I get tired of people fighting, you know, uh, make, hitting pay dirt and then getting divorced. Well, you just don't understand. I understand that when you, when you had to walk in love and the options weren't as easy. Let's face it, if you got $20 million, it's a whole lot easier to walk away than when you got $20 in the bank. Then to walk, work through it. Amen. Sometimes people have to work, have to work through stuff. Then a lot of times when there's so much money floating around, it's easy just to walk away from it. You don't need to walk away just because it's easier. We still have to live by faith and walk in love. Amen? One amen. Thank you. Can I get another one over here somewhere? Can I get one again? One for the audio room. How to do? Yeah, come on. All right. Godliness with contentment. Now, Paul said over in the, in the fourth chapter of the book of Philippians, remember this? He said, I've learned how to be a base. I've learned how to abound. And I've been initiated in, and this, this kind of mix up some different versions. I've been initiated in every situation of life. And, but one thing I've learned is to be independent of the circumstances. You've got it. You know, the King James says they're in to be content. But uh, um, uh, Phillips, in, I mean, 20th century, so I would say independent of the circumstances. Over there in Philippians 4. 11 down through there. Um, see, if you can learn to have the character that where money doesn't control you either way. But you know, let's face it, most of us are not in that place where we've got $4 million sitting in the bank. Including myself. Like that. I'd, I'd love to have $4 million sitting in the bank. Boy, what I could do with that. Amen. Praise the Lord. We brought nothing into the world. We can't carry anything out. Now, that does, what's, that, now, now listen, that doesn't mean go live dirt poor and, and, and just go, I don't want any of this old world's goods. That's, that's a lie you do. Stop lying. But be content. But, you know, having food and raiment there with be content. Content, you can be satisfied and still have desire. In other words, you're not, you know, I'll tell you what, a, a good sign of lack of contentment is you'll do anything to get the money. Yeah. That's why people sell drugs. That's why people rob banks. Hello? That's why they embezzle. Because they, they, want, they want, they're not, they can't be content. They're not happy. You know, they can't keep driving a car. You know, um, <clears throat> we got us a new, new van at Christmas. But you know what? That was the first new vehicle we had. Um, we bought our, our Jeep in 2002 and our other van in, three th in 2003. So it was almost 10 years on, the, it, was, it was a month short of 10 years on the Jeep. And um, um, but it was a 2003 van we bought it in 2002. We bought it the same year. We bought it in August of the same year. <clears throat> um, and um, it's been almost 10 years for, for, between vehicles. And, th and that's still not, it wasn't brand new. It was a, it was a program van. It knocked a bunch of money off the price by doing that. But you know what? I mean, it's, it's new to us. But there were times that you, you're riding down the road and, and so, things start getting, making noises. You know how your, your vehicles start making noises? Y'all know what I'm talking about, don't you? Start to get the funky squeal, get the weird rattle. You know, this is messing up. Your power steering goes when you're turning it. And you go in, how, what, it's going to cost you $1,300 to have the rack replaced. So you get rid of that sound. They said $1,300, I thought, hey, that's, nice. that, that's a choir singing how, how Great Thou Art in the background. Hallelujah. When I, every time I hear it, that's $1,300 talking to me. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. But learning to be content in life, meaning you become satisfied in God. Your joy cannot rest in possessions and money. Amen. Now, with that said, amen. Amen. With that said, let's move on. Um, you got a lot of people who, who think not having money is some type of um, a badge of courage. Remember the red badge of courage? Most of y'all had the Steinbeck's red badge of courage. You had to write, read that in high school. A lot of stuff we had to read in high school. 
that would be shot and they can read them. I mean, Edgar Allan Poe was a, was a heroin addict. Hallelujah. But they, they, they want to say, well, you know, Job, God cursed Job and Job didn't have anything. You know, in Job 42.10, Job 42.10, he got everything back doubled. God restored to him double. I'd like to have, you know, God, God can restore. God wants you to be blessed. So when I said the things about character, it's not telling you not to have prosperity and not believe God for prosperity. Make sure your motivations are right. Check your heart. Um, Dad Hagen said this one time, he, and the Lord spoke to him around 19, 1951 or something. Maybe it was. Somewhere, somewhere, somewhere in that era of his life. And I said, put all, I want you to take all your, your tapes that you got recorded, all the reel to reels they had recorded on old reel to reel, and I want you to put them in book form. And so he kind of started looking around, and, people, and some men came to him, businessmen. Oh, we want to put, we want to pay for you to have your, all your tapes put in book form. Yep. Maybe, it may not be in the early 50s, well, maybe a little bit later, but anyway. He said, uh, pay for you, and uh, you can make a lot of money. Now, the Lord already told him to do it, but they see, he stopped and did not do it for years until he could know in his heart he was doing it for the purpose of what the Lord told him and not to make a lot of money. Now, here's, your, here's what you hear Dad say, or used to, you can see go listen to his tapes. What am I going to do with all that money? I'm going to put it right back into the work of the gospel. We're going to print more books. We're going to win more for Jesus. We're going to get more people healed. We're going to get more people filled with the Holy Ghost. We're going to do more for the kingdom of God. It wasn't about his personal prosperity, writing the books for the kingdom. It, the, the proceeds went in and went back into the ministry to advance the kingdom. That's what he was after. See, that's the right heart. Amen? We get people today, man, man you do this, we can, get you, we can make you a lot of money in your church. And they're jumping all over trying to make money for their church. Actually, usually it's for them. Y'all hear you going home. One guy made so much money selling books, he gave his salary back to his church. And he wrote, he wrote hogwash number one, bunch of bunk, garbage. Paraphrases stuck, there got to be two verses out of a paraphrase that stuck them together to make it match his doctrine. And keeps adding on to that whole theme and making, making money selling the books. And then he says, God, God's called some people to be rich, and he's one of them. Writing books on why you're supposed to be poor and be in the will of God. Because God's only made a few certain select. Oh, bless your heart, you got the money, and you're supposed to be the one that gets to be rich. Wow, lolly, lolly, lolly. That's just junk. And God wants to bless everybody. Amen? All right. So Job got it all back. Poverty is not the will of God. Poverty is part of the curse. Remember when, and, and, and if we go back into, um, into um, Genesis, and you get over here in Genesis chapter 3, Yep. Genesis chapter 3. We get, we'll get on down here in, 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 in verse 17. And, and to Adam he said, Behold, thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree which, which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground, for out of it thou was taken, and dust thou art, and dust shalt thou return. Uh, now, God, this is poverty. Before the earth just brought forth and blessed, and now he's going to have to work it. He's going to have to labor. It's going to bring forth thorns. How many have ever had a garden? Now, I, I, I remember back at our old house, which was next door to Adams here, we, we'd go back behind our fence, and we, we'd put up a raised flower, a raised bed there, put a garden in it. I'd go out there, and we'd till it up, we'd fertilize it, we'd put, you know, plant all of our stuff in there, and, you know, get a little bit busy and, and, and not take care of it like you should, and go out there, and, and your, little, your little garden thing's about this tall, and there'd be weeds this tall. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm talking this tall. You're out there, you pull them up, and they got root systems this big. You're thinking, how'd that happen? Sucking all the nutrients out of the soil, 
I mean, you're, you're a little be shading out. You're a little plants. So you're trying to grow. Can't even get your stuff to grow because the weeds are, 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 are uh, you know, taller than your kids were at the time. Yeah. That's the curse. That's the curse on the earth. Poverty is a part of the curse. It came on the earth. Now, we don't have to live under that, but it's still there. You, as, a, as a Christian, you can walk out from under that curse of poverty. That's what I'm trying to make reference to. God said that the ground was going to bring forth thorn, thorns and thistles. Apparently, the rose bushes didn't have thorns before. Wouldn't that be nice? How pretty, pretty. Oh! And, and we, you know, look, it only takes a big thorn bush to, to, I mean, a rose bush to hurt. Little ones hurt. And you go prune them, and you got to take them out to the street, and the, and the guys come pick them up the next week. They got to pick them up. They better have gloves. Now, back earlier, uh, when the serpent came to Adam, uh, Eve, in verse 4 or 3, um, it says, But the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest ye die. Now, um, Back over verse 17 of the previous chapter, God said this. He said, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest, thou shalt, sure, thou shalt surely die. Now the margin says, the Hebrew says, In dying thou shalt die. Why? Because man was spiritually alive. Man was never created to physically, spiritually, or any other way die. He was created to live perpetual in a certain, in a state of maturity, but never grow old, never wear out, never die. Hello? But God said, in dying thou shalt die. See, there's two deaths. The first death was spiritual. He became separated from God. Amen? So the, so the first part of the curse is spiritual death. When man sinned, he became spiritually dead or spiritually separated from God. Amen. And then the second curse was poverty. That was working by the sweat of your brow all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles brought forth out of the, out of the ground. And then the third curse we find over in, in uh, Exodus where God said that uh, if you, you disobey these commandments, then all these curses which have been on the Egyptians will become on you. Okay, so the, the three curses of the fall of man or poverty or spiritual death, poverty and sickness. Oh, but thank God. Now, thank God we're redeemed from that. Amen. Now, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 28, if you look at Deuteronomy 28, man. How many like Deuteronomy 28 verses 1 through 14? But 15 through, through the rest of the chapter ain't no fun. Come to pass, if you hearken not to the voice of the Lord your God, to observe all his commandments, his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon you. I'm just going to read a few just to kind of get you stirred up. Bless you, to bless you a little bit. Cursed shalt thou be in the city, cursed shalt thou be in the field, cursed shalt thou be in thy basket and store, cursed shall be the fruit of thy body, the fruit of thy land, the increase of thy kind, the flock of thy sheep. Cursed shalt thou be when thou goest, comest in, and cursed shalt thou be when thou goest out. The Lord shall send upon thee cursing, vexation, rebuke, and all thou sendest thine hand unto, for to do, until thou be destroyed, until the, thou perish quickly, because of the wickedness of thy doings, whereby thou forsaken me. And that's probably enough curses to read. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, I mean, curse coming in and curse going out. God pretty much covers it. Yeah. Others are just details. Amen. I said others are just details. So y'all here, you gone home. <laughs> and it goes on like that for the next uh, until through verse 68. <laughs> curse, 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 curse. I mean sicknesses and, and plagues and stuff that's not even written in the book. I'm going to come on them. The Lord make that place wonderful. That, 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 can, I, that doesn't mean wonderful in a good sense. It's dreadful, really. And, and the plagues of that seed, even the great plagues of long countenance, sore sickness, long continuance. He'll bring all the diseases of Egypt, which you were afraid of, and they'll cleave unto you. Every sickness and every plague, which is not written in this book of law, then will the Lord bring upon thee until you be destroyed. I tell you what, I, it just wasn't a good thing to not do what God wanted you to do. Now, he, in the verse four, first 14 verses, he talked about all the blessings that were going to come on you. And you see, you didn't, need, you didn't need but 14 verses to cover the blessings because they were so good you couldn't hardly take them. Amen? If you read this, poverty is a curse. Yes. Now, Galatians, the third chapter, states that Christ has redeemed us 
from the curse of the law being made a curse for us for it is written cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ that we might receive the promise of the spirit through faith now very interesting because you'll get people say well that's you know, that being redeemed from the curse is just for the Jews he said we're redeemed from the curse law that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles so the curse law affect everybody including the Jews it wasn't just a cur the curse was not just to the Jewish nation it was to all peoples on the earth. The curse covered the whole earth. Spiritual death, poverty, and sickness covered the whole earth. Jesus came to redeem us from the curse. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad you can be redeemed? Purchased, bought back, delivered. Amen. So the blessing of Abraham is threefold. Amen. Because he said, you know, he said, hey, receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. He goes on and talks about, you know, you know uh, God confirmed his covenant. Abraham's blessing is threefold. I'll bless you, I'll bless you. I'll increase you and increase you. That's financial. Amen. It's spiritual. He had a promise uh, of redemption through the seed. Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And, um, and, and it's also physical. God gave promise to those who, who would walk according to his word, physical help and blessing. So God blessed um, him with uh, multi, uh, length of days. Amen. God gave, gave him length of days. Abraham was about 125 when he, when he died, somewhere in that neighborhood. Length, I, I like length of days. Amen. Amen. I like what, what, what Moses wrote um, to those who abode under the shadow of the Almighty. Um, I, with long life will I satisfy thee and show thee my salvation. Oh, thank God for long life. And I got news for you, 53 and 54 ain't long life. I'm just a whippersnapper. Hallelujah. Y'all here, you gone home. What do you mean, I'm 53, 54, 55, that's whippersnapper age. Hello? What are you when you're 20? Still, still in diapers. All right. In, in that, that perspective. Praise the Lord. Um, verse 16 says, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not unto seeds as of many, or plural, but as of one unto thy seed, which is Christ. Verse 29. And if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. You can't come in and say this, this covenant of prosperity and the blessing and all those things and being delivered from the curse of the law is for the Jews only. It is for the church. Anybody who's born of God. Amen. You know, Psalm, wanna, um, look at Psalm 50. Psalm 50. Psalm 50, that's right after Psalm 49. Just thought I'd help you out a little bit. Verse 10. For every beast of the field is mine, and the cattle upon a thousand hills. I know all the fowls of the mountains, and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would, I would not tell thee, for the world is mine, and the fullness thereof. Glory to God. God says the earth is his and the fullness thereof. Well, who's it him for? Why, is it, why does he have that? It's for the church. It's for us. It's for his people. God has always blessed his people. Verse Psalm 24, 1. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Hallelujah. So God has established the fact that, the, the, you know, that one guy says he owns a cow of a thousand hills. Another person said, and yeah, and the taters under him. It makes you a meat and potatoes man, doesn't it? Amen. If he owns a cow of a thousand hills and the, and the taters under him, that's a meat and potatoes man or woman. That's me. Glory to God. I love meat and taters. Praise God. Hallelujah. So God, God the earth belongs to the Lord. The, 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 the blessings are the, are, are, are the fullness thereof. Hallelujah. 
God wants you to have all the blessings that coming upon your life. It's not the, his design. Now remember we talked about earlier, we just talked, we, when we, I want to make sure we understand. At the beginning I was talking about having your character right because God wants you to be able to handle it. He didn't want you to get a million dollars and then go out and, and, and become a, a heathen sinner. He doesn't. Hallelujah. Now let's look back at Deuteronomy 28 again. Look at the blessings. We didn't read all those curses. We just read enough just to kind of whet your appetite on how it was to be out from under the blessings of God. I just rather live under the blessings. Amen. You got people running around who all they want to talk about is they, they can live under grace. Well, they can just, you know, and, and do whatever they want to do. I just rather live under, uh, do what God told me to do and still live under grace. And honor Him. Amen. Verse 1, Deuteronomy 28. And it shall come to pass if thou hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and do all His commandments which I commanded this day that the Lord thy God will set thee. Now notice here that obedience to the commands of God brought the blessing. Amen. That the Lord thy God will set thee on high of all nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come only and overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Blessed shalt thou be in the city, and blessed shalt thou be in the field. Remember that curse thing? This is kind of a catch-all too. If you're blessed in the city, in the field, blessed in the fruit of your body, blessed in your ground, blessed in the fruit of thy cow, the increase of thy kind, the flocks of thy sheep, blessed shall be thy basket and thy store, blessed shalt thou be when thou comest in and when thou goest out. <laughs> That, cover, that pretty much covers it, doesn't it? If you're blessed coming in, blessed going out, you're just blessed everywhere. Because either you're, you're either coming or going no matter where you are. Amen, Brother Bill? So, yeah, it means you're covered. The Lord shall cause thine enemies that rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face. They shall come out against thee one way and flee before thee seven ways. The Lord shall command the blessing upon thee and thy storehouses. Modern-day vernacular, bank accounts. The FDIC only covers $100,000 in insurance. So if you get more than $100,000, you don't want to have it in the same account. You want to have another, you want to open up another account. So bless thee in thy storehouses, and in all thou settest thine hand unto, he shall bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. The Lord shall establish thee a holy people. And here's that character thing, a holy people. Blessings with character. I said blessings with character. Yeah. Uh, a holy people unto himself as that he has sworn unto thee if thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God and walk in his ways. And all the people of the earth shall see that thou art called by the name of the Lord and they shall be afraid of thee. See God wants us to live in a way even in prosperity and blessing and overflow that still honors and represents him. We don't become something different. We still honor him. Hello. We don't, we don't use our money wrongly. We use it to bless and honor the kingdom. Uh, number one, you tithe to your local church. I, I just get amazed at how many people think they can do whatever they want to with the money they have. Well, the Lord told me to do this. He don't tell you to do something his word didn't tell you to do. And if you're not, uh, and you're supposed to be in local, if you're not in the local church and you're not tithing to the local church, I'm giving my money over here. You're not, you, you can't do that. You can't. Come rob me and then go give it to Brother Copeland and expect to be blessed. And God said, if you don't bring the tithe to the storehouse, you're a robber. Yeah, but I gave it to so-and-so. You're a robber. You're, you can't, you're robbing somebody, you're robbing God to pay God. They have, they, people go to jail for that stuff. Hello? Cheat on your taxes so you can have enough money to pay your taxes and see what happens. These weird looking little people with, with glasses and briefcases will show up at your house. With government ID badges saying I'm from the IRS. All right. The Lord shall, listen, the Lord shall make thee plenteous in goods and in the fruit of thy body and the fruit of thy cattle and the fruit of thy ground and the land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers to give thee. The Lord, shall open unto, the Lord shall open unto his good treasure, the heaven to give rain unto the land in its season and to bless all the work of thy hand and thou shalt lend to many nations and thou shalt not borrow. The Lord shall make thee the head and not the tail. Thou shalt be above only and not beneath. If thou hearken unto the commandment of the Lord thy God, which I command this day to observe and to do them. 
And thou shalt not go aside from any of the words which I commanded this day to the right hand or to the left to go after other gods to serve them. But if thou, if thou, if it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe, curse, 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 curse. Now he keeps throwing in holy, obeying, not going to the right or going to the left. That there is that character fl flow with the faith for prosperity. Hello. Now, what's that got to do with faith? James 4, look over there. James chapter 4. I'm sorry, James chapter 5, verse 1. Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl, for your miseries shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and you shall eat your flesh as it were fire. You have heaped together treasure. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I'm reading the wrong verse. James chapter 4, I was right. Verse 2. Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot attain. Ye fight in war, yet ye have not because ye ask not. Ye have not because ye ask not. You ask and receive not because you ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your own lust. Now, so, now listen, James is a pretty rebuke, rebukive, rebukive? rebuking letter. Letter for the purpose of rebuking. There's a lot of rebuke and reproof in James. And it's a New Testament book. Hallelujah. He says you have not because you ask not. And then he says you ask and receive not because you ask amiss. In other words, okay, number one, if you're, if you're not getting anything, it's because you're not asking. Two, if you are asking and not getting it, you're asking with the wrong motive. You want to consume it upon lust. Hello. He doesn't want you to become like he talks about these rich men over here in chapter 5. So you can have a lot of money and serve God and be, and be right with the Lord. You can have a lot of money and be just a, uh, Bill Gates said a number of years ago, he said he has no need for God. He's got, you know, worth 80, or used to be worth 80 billion dollars. I think Microsoft's lost some value, so he's just down to a measly 52 or 53 billion. He has no need for God. He lives in a 50 million dollar house. He has no need for God. Well, see, that is the wealth the wealth controlling the man instead of the man controlling the wealth. I have no need for God because I have all this money. We want to talk about how you got Microsoft started. <laughs> anyway, in one person's sense, you could probably just say pure dumb luck. You know, he just had to be the high guy at home who knew how to get a hold of the operating system. Some guy gave it to him for 50 bucks or whatever. Hallelujah. But ye ask not and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your own lust. So, God wants us to be blessed, walk in the blessings. You have to ask for the blessings, but you can't ask for them wrongly or with the wrong motive. And I think a lot of people favored, loved, desired, wanted to be involved in the prosperity message, wanted to give to the preacher, give up, stuff money in the preacher's pocket, buy the tape series on how to get rich overnight, you know, four easy steps to being a, 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 a millionaire as a Christian in three weeks, um, you know, how God taught me to have the hundredfold return, um, you can only give to the preachers and, you, and you'll be blessed, uh, those kind of things, whatever tape series you listen to. I think and supernatural debt, can, I believe, you know, listen, anytime that your debt's cancel the supernatural uh, when, when you weren't expecting it, you know, so to speak. I think a lot of people came in and were throwing money out there because they, they didn't want to pay the price to do what God said. They didn't want to do it God's way. They were hoping it was some magical formula with a hocus pocus, pull the lever, wham, bam, there you go, it's mine, I got it. And they're debt free and they're around and all they're interested in was getting that money because they had all these plans to live lasciviously. And it didn't work because they were just asking amiss. Nobody want, listen, people don't teach this when they're teaching hundredfold return night. Yeah. Why? Because it messes up the offering. 
Come on now. They don't teach this when they want everybody to come up and shove money in their coat pocket and, and wear blossoming um, windsuit type coats that have got elastic bottom so when you shove the money in it don't fall out. Saw that one time. Just, just, just really bothered me. Bothered me. Just, I was greatly bothered and distressed by that. Well, you don't preach. You're asking wrong because you want you're giving because you want to consume it upon your lust. They don't preach that. They don't want to preach that. Why? It messes up the offering. You don't get tapes out on the tape table of, of the prosperity, a lot of these prosperity people that said, if you ask for the wrong motive, you won't get anything. Four, set, four tape series on, or four CD series on. Why, why you're not going to be blessed if you had the wrong attitude? You don't get it. But the truth of the matter is, there's a lot of people who have not prospered, not because they didn't have faith, but they were asking amiss because they wanted to consume it upon lust. And God doesn't bless that. I said, God doesn't bless that. Thank you for your three enthusiastic looks, your four, I can't believe you said that looks, and the rest of you, the cow at the new gate look. Hallelujah. If you're going to walk in prosperity, have faith in prosperity, and live out of your inner man, you're going to have to live out of your inner man in character. You have to live out of that, you know what I'm saying? You have your mind and remind you and, and, and build those things and know what's right and wrong. Isaiah 119, we, we all know this one. We've heard, you know, of course, everybody, you know, the new thing now is nothing in the Old Testament is relevant. Especially if it, say, if it tells you you've got to do something. Anything that tells you you've got to do something is not relevant anymore at all whatsoever. We are under grace. Of course, we can again point them to the book of Ephesians, chapters 5 or 6 or 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. <laughs> Amen. For this is right. It's the first commandment with promise. That it may be well with thee, that thou mayest live long on the earth. Paul, the preacher of grace, gave and referenced and enforced in the new covenant of grace a commandment of obedience. And conditions on long life tied to it. What do you got to say about that, Brother Bill? That's true. True. Thank you. Isaiah 119 says, if you be willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. And have a willing heart to obey God, obedient to the things God tells you to do. Amen. God wants, you to, God wants to bless you. But there's, there are things that go with, you know, your faith. Understand this. When Paul talked about, I have faith without works, he's talking about the works of the law. His, his faith is, he still had corresponding action. Because James, when James says, show me your faith by your, by, uh, without your works, I'll show you faith, my faith by my works. In other words, really when James is talking, he's referring to corresponding actions. Paul is talking about the law. Two different things. James is saying faith has actions that correspond with it. Paul is saying that when I believe that I'm born again by the blood of Jesus and I confess him as Lord, I still don't go out and make this blood sacrifices to get saved. I'm free by the, from the worst of the law. And, and you've got to interpret these things within the right context and the right scope of everything. You just can't go, well, everything in the Old Covenant's the law. Actually, it wasn't. Abraham was the father of faith. What Abraham did was by faith. Abraham tithed by faith. Your tithing's in the law, but your tithing was before the law. Abraham paid tithe to Melchizedek. Jesus is a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. We are the seed of Abraham. Therefore, we should follow the example of our spiritual father and pay tithes to the priest who's after the order of Melchizedek, Jesus, under the new covenant. There was just more rules applied to tithing under the law, but under faith, tithing is still there. Amen. All right. And bringing us up to that subject of, Ma of Malachi chapter 3. Yeah, that's the Old Testament. Yeah. I had some, I'll tell you what, some of these people out on Facebook, you know, just they probably, 
need, need a, a, a asylum help. They're lunatics. They say some of the dumbest stuff. But you got people now going around, you know, the, you know, to Malachi. You know, we don't we don't have to tithe. You know, what are you going to do with Hebrews? If you don't believe in tithing, you're going to have to cut Hebrews out. Now you can't have the part in Hebrews which says Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the word of God sharpened any two-edged sword to the dividing son of soul and spirit. Or that we don't look at the things which are seen, but the things which are unseen. You can't, well, well that's, that's Corinthians. Um, but Hebrews, you know, 4.12 and then Hebrews 13.8, you know, Jesus is the same. And then go to the part about tithing and not do it. You can't, you can't just throw parts of the Bible that you don't like. Malachi chapter 3, verse 7. Even from the days of your fathers, you have gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But you said, wherein shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But you say, wherein have we robbed thee? And the answer is, in tithes and offerings. And you are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation, bring you all the tithe into the storehouse. That there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I not open unto you the windows of heaven, and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast a fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed, for you shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. Verse 13, your words have been stout against me, saith the Lord, yet ye say, where, where, uh, what have we spoken so much against thee? Ye have said it is vain to serve God, and what profit is it to keep his ordinances that we have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts? Ah, we don't have to do that anymore. We don't do that. I'm going to tell you something. You can't come in and say, I'm under grace, I can commit adultery. Adultery, God, Jesus, Jesus, adultery is still adultery. Well, I'm under grace. I can, I can go sleep with any, any man's wife I want to sleep with. It doesn't matter because I'm under grace. You can't say, I don't have to tithe. Well, Hebrews talks about tithing. As a, as a command. Jesus said, remember when we talk about over there in... Um, Maybe, maybe, you no, know, Luke 6 30 says, Give and shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give unto your bosom. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. But you remember what Jesus is talking about um, the law? He says, You, you tithe anis, a -N -I -S, and mint, and have, uh, and have um, what's the word he uses? Something, the weightier matters of the law, forgotten or not done, the weightier matters of the law. He said this. He didn't say, don't do the other. He said, these all ye have done and not left the other undone. In other words, you should have been tithing and still doing the other things. Jesus talked about tithing. You got people now saying that, that Jesus, Jesus was before, the, uh, the things he taught was all before um, the church started. It's not relevant. Oh, yeah, that's out there big time. Why? Because there's things that Jesus said that messes up their doctrine. So now they got a revelation. Yeah, isn't that amazing? The Holy Ghost came to remind us of all things that Jesus said unto the church. Of things that aren't relevant to us. He came just to remind us of the things that aren't relevant. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that what Jesus said? The Holy Spirit, when, when the teachers come, when the, when the, when the paracletes come, he'll, he'll teach you all things and remind you all things whatsoever I've said, or said unto you. And you got people saying that whatever Jesus says is not important. It's before the church began. Yet he, he, he sent the Holy Ghost to come and to tell us what he said just so we could know what wasn't relevant anymore. So I say some of these people need institutional care. They're dumber than dirt. Hallelujah. Given it shall be given unto you. So God wants us to prosper. God wants us to walk in the blessings. I tell you, if we'll do it the way God said do it, and walk in faith according to the word concerning finances and prosperity, I'm telling you, God will bless you. God wants you blessed. God's not trying to withhold it from you. I think a lot of times we, we, we've spent so much time trying to get people to believe that God wants us to, we haven't dealt with some of the reasons they haven't. And I honestly, I honestly believe from Scripture 
the, the character and, and the desire to spend things wrongly or amiss have been some of the undermining uh, things or issues. It's why a lot of people haven't prospered. Although they've tithed and given and believed and their heart's not right. You know, what do you do? You check up on your heart. You check in your character issues. When you dream about being rich, what do you dream of? Robin, whatever his name is, Leech or Lynch, whatever, Leech. You know, a lifestyle's of the rich and famous. You know, I want to be on that show. Have me a cruise boat that goes out the, a, a seaworthy cruise boat. Hallelujah. Cru cruise vessel. You know, you can live on your, we went to Atlantis. Uh, Shannon's graduation trip. Yeah, that summer. When I went to Atlantis. And went to the docks because we had one of the crews. We went to Nassau. We went over to that. You need to take a taxi over there, and you can walk the docks. And they got all these huge—I mean, huge—seaworthy uh, vessels. Just, just people's house on water. I mean, 80, 90 foot long. You know, three stories. I mean, they're they're for open sea. They're they're, they're designed for that. <laughs> Millions of dollars. Yeah, that's what I want. I want to have that in this cruise around the world. It's nothing wrong with wanting stuff. It's nothing wrong with having things. But if all you can think about is how much stuff you can get and you can't even think about winning the loss and building the kingdom, something's wrong. If your first heart isn't that, what can I do to build the kingdom? Something's wrong. It's okay to have the desire for things as long as they're in the right place. And that's what we're saying. We're not saying don't want things. Have them in the right place. Have your heart in the right place. God, God can bless a man or woman whose heart is in the right place. But no matter what they have, it belongs to him. Amen?